There's this common misconception going around that I don't have to worship God until I, I feel him moving. Until I can sense him doing so. We, we have to be sometimes feel like we have to be moved to worship, moved to praise. The problem is that's not biblical. And if that's our attitude, we may never get to feel him. But I came this morning to worship him. When I think about the goodness of Jesus, come on somebody, and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I don't know if that's your feeling this morning. Come on, I, I wonder if a spirit of worship would just invade the building right now. If somebody would get boisterous in their praise, if somebody would get excited and thankful, if I can just think back to what he has done in my past, if I can think back to everything that he paid for me, to every debt being covered, the mercy of God. There was this group of military commanders that came together and the community outside of the base was upset because of the noise associated with all that the military was doing. So these commanders got together and they said, we've got to do something about the public outside of the base, but we can't. We can't quiet what we're doing. We can't cease operations. So they got together and they said, the best we can do is put a, sound, a sign outside of the base. We'll put it as they enter into the gate to let the public know what's going on and the reason for all of this. On that sign, it read, please pardon our noise. This is just the sound of freedom. And I don't know if anybody here feels like that this morning. But if you would say, just pardon my noise, this is the sound of, of freedom. You don't know where I was. You don't know what he brought me out of, how far down he had to pick me up. I wonder if anybody this morning would get a little bit excited about all that he has done for you. Can we worship him together this morning?
prayer requests this morning. Linda Brown is recovering from surgery and she needs our prayer. Uh, Darlene Spears is very sick and she's also having upcoming surgery, needs our prayers. Bob Kidd, he has pancreatic cancer, a friend of Mark Riles. David Gruber, stage four cancer, brother Jed's neighbor. Kylie Ray, she needs positive results. This little ba baby has been battling a disease they're not quite sure what it is. Billy Smith, not feeling well. Baby Eleanor has COVID, and Alan Tarvin has severe burns on legs and feet, and Sister Nancy Smith has requested prayer. Amen. You know, thousands of years ago, God delivered three Hebrew children, or men, young men, through their troubles after refusing to bow and worship Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. They chose faith over fear. And because of their humble refusal and determination, the king commanded that the fire would be stoked seven times hotter than it was originally. They were thrown into the fire as for punishment, but they were not burned. Not only were they not burned, but the Bible says that they walked through the fire, coming through its flames with no hurt on any of them. And they were delivered through the fire through their tribulation and we know that sometimes God doesn't deliver us from a situation but God will deliver you through a situation sometimes we have to face the enemy for God to be exalted sometimes our problems are situations in which God will show himself faithful if you will stand up and say I'm going to be counted I am a child of God he is on my side and yes I might have to walk through this fire but I'm going to walk through it because he is with me how many of you feel this morning that some Sometimes you're just walking through that fire, but I want you to know uh, you're not going to be burned. I want you to know it's going to have no hurt on thee. I want you to know this morning that you're going to come through uh, on the other side and your God will be lifted up and exalted. Uh, your God uh, will be brought to the forefront of anything that you face because you are an overcomer because he's on your side. No, oh, there are sometimes we face situations and we don't understand. But we can be assured that we are always going to come out on the other side of things. Can we stand before the Lord this morning? How many of you have a need that you need God to take you through the other side of things? 
How many of you have a need that you've been, Lord, I don't understand. Well, let him take you through it. And you're going to see the glory of his presence. Why don't we bow our heads and pray for those that have requested our petitions. But I also know that there are needs in this place today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your mighty word this morning. That God, so many times we want to be delivered from, Lord God. When you want us to go through so that your glory would be manifest in that situation. That your light would shine upon us, Lord God, and bring favor, Lord Jesus, to your name and your promises. Lord, I pray for those in this place right now that are in the fiery trial of their faith, oh Lord God. But Lord, you have left this promise and this assurance to God. Uh, in another day, in another moment, it's going to all be over and you're going to come through. Tried by the fires of life and yet an overcomer. Lord, we pray for those that are sick and afflicted this morning. We pray for Linda Brown and Darlene Spears that, God, you would heal and recover them both. We pray for Mr. Kent, that, Lord God, you would heal him of pancreatic cancer, that, God, he will not have to go through treatment. We pray for David Gruber, that, God, his soul would be saved. We pray for Kylie Riles. We pray for Ellen Tarver and those, oh, Lord God, that are suffering, Lord God, in their body. We know that you are able. You, Lord God, are a miracle-working God. And we're so thankful and grateful because you are great and great to save.
Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. I'm not Brother Langle today. I'm Brother Willie Green. And the first Sunday of the month, we always do missions. And I have an opportunity to do one of my favorites, Honduras. And I asked Pastor, uh, Pastor Machado, I said, Pastor Machado, I'm going to be talking to the congregation. Is there anything you would like to say to the church? And, and he sent me a message. He said, God bless you. Tell Pastor Shepherd and the Church of Columbus, in the, the Church of Kamayawa and himself, his family, thank you for your support of our ministry. That it was for Jesus who allowed this relationship between both churches that we would do everything in our hands to honor that support that we have given us by educating souls to be saved. It has been a wonderful thing for me, myself, to be a part of missions in Honduras, in Kamayawa to be exact. Uh, behind me, they should have some uh, slides there uh, coming up. Uh, I was there in June, in June of this year, and they put the flooring in. The, floor, the sanctuary has a flooring in now. And, and you'll see some other things. Uh, you'll see a baptistry. To, almost two years ago, Brother Francisco and Brother Russell Lane uh, were in Honduras with me, and they built the baptistry that we have a baptistry there uh, inside the sanctuary. And also you should see some other pictures uh, of the kids. Each Sunday, we make sure that the kids down there, they, they have a snack for each one of the kids. It's been a wonderful thing to be a part of that church uh, in Kamayawa. They really send their, their appreciation to you. In Isaiah 6 and 8, the prophet Isaiah said, the Lord said, who will go? And Isaiah said, here am I, I will go. God, all of us can't go to Honduras. However, one of the three T's, talent, time, and treasure. Thank you for your treasures that you're giving in support of mission throughout the, the world. world. I would ask each and every one that is in this congregation to go down Mission Hallway and just look. And if you ever got a family member, you can see that and pray for our missionaries. And we're so thankful for this church that we have a building, they have a classroom, uh, they have a kitchen. And the next endeavor that we want to do in, in Honduras, uh, they're doing now, a person that has volunteered to be a teacher how to bake bread. We want the church in Kamiyawa to be self-sustainable as far as financially. Be, in August, they'll start learning how to bake bread so they can sell the bread, and they're going to specialize and start putting fruits and nuts in the bread, and that's how the church can have sustainable income to keep the lights on, to buy Sunday school material. Those are the things that we are endeavoring uh, in, the, in the city of uh, Kamiyawa, Honduras. Thank you, Church of Columbus, for your wonderful support. And as you know, there are people outside of the church that have uh, donated, and I am so appreciative that I can be a conduit and a, just a mouthpiece to tell people about Honduras. Uh, there's a person that is going to buy 100 chairs for Honduras. There's a person that put the class, put the uh, cement floors in, in they donated their, their money to put cement flooring in the classroom, in the kitchen. And it's just so many more things. Uh, the Refrigerator, someone has donated $500 to purchase a refrigerator for, Hondur for the church in Honduras. So I'm very thankful for Brother Lango and this church allowing me to talk about Honduras. Thank you very much. So good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. I came in and uh, several of the folks I talked to, they, they were absolutely jovial. And I thought, wow, this is a wonderful way 
the start of Sunday morning. Amen. A lot of folks take off on Sunday to, uh, well, do all kind of stuff. They sleep in, they play golf, things other than being in God's house. <clears throat> but uh, remember we talked about last week, John said I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. First day of the week. Hallelujah. In God's house with God's people, worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth on the Lord's day. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. Welcome to all of the lo- folks who are in the Lord's house. If you're visiting with us today, Brother McClary just uh, called several names. It's so good to have you. Uh, this is the perfect place for you to be on the first day of the week. Amen. And God is here. And it is amazing what God will do when folks will let him. That's right. The Old Testament prophet recorded it this way. I will work, but who will let it? God wants to. We just need to let him. I need salvation. Well, he's here to give you that. I'll work, but who will let it? I need healing. He's here to give you that. Well, I need provision. I lost my job. God will provide your jobs. I don't know about Pastor Shepherd. I do. I've been watching it happen ever since I was a kid. That's right. I remember, I remember uh, <clears throat> Mother Shepherd laying hands on people. She laid hands on a little lady one time that was blind, prayed for her, and immediately the lady was able to see. Mother Shepherd had been paying a lady to go by this, this sister's house and clean up for her and help out. And uh, after a few weeks, she went by to check on her. <clears throat> and uh, when she went in, the house smelled. It was unkempt. looked like it hadn't been cleaned at all. The lady was hungry. And she began to inquire, you know, what, what, what's happening here? Someone's supposed to be taking care of you. Well, I haven't seen them in a while, and they don't clean up, and I haven't eaten in a couple of days. And Mother Shepherd realized there's a solution to this and it's not sending somebody over there to help out. And she laid hands on her and immediately God opened her eyes and she was able to see. See, that's the kind of God we serve. Now, I don't know what kind of God you serve, but that's the kind of God we serve. Yeah. Hallelujah. So welcome to the Lord's house. This is a good day to be in the Lord's house. <clears throat> and God is here to meet your need. Welcome to all of our saints, all of our faithful saints. Thank God for faithful people in an unfaithful world. You can't depend on politicians. You can't depend on the federal government. Sometimes you can't even depend on your friends. But I'm thankful we can depend on Jesus and we can depend on one another. Hallelujah. Billy Graham said, a checkbook is a theological document. It'll tell you who and what you worship. In a matter of hours, Job's entire family and fortune were taken away from him. The richest man in the country overnight had become the poorest man in town. Shortly thereafter, even his health began to fail as boils covered his entire body. So he sat in ashes on the fireplace hearth, wrapped in sackcloth, finding some semblance of relief as he scraped himself with a piece of broken pottery. He could have thrown in the towel. He could have capitulated to his wife's incessant pleas to just curse God and die. He could have leveled bitter accusations against the God who had given him such blessing in the first place. But instead, Job chose to take the high road. Job chapter 1, verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. When circumstances cried out for vengeance, when the loss of his children begged for retribution, when the pain in his heart enveloped him in a dark shroud of unbearable grief, When he could have cursed God and died, Job worshipped. The word worship from the original Hebrew intimates the 
the bowing of the human will to the divine will of God. Job, what is your response to having everything one day and nothing the next? Chapter 1, verse 21, he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord gave, that's a part we forget sometimes, the Lord gave, the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When we truly understand that everything we have came from God, and it can quickly be returned to God, then I just don't believe we would be so greedily possessive of our possessions. Remember, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. One insightful observer once said, you should give according to your income, lest God make your income according to your giving. I'm thankful. My wife and I are blessed people. You know why? Because we obey this book. And this book says, give and it shall be given unto you. We gave when we didn't have to give and trusted that if we would plant the seed, God would give the increase. And he has. Don't you dare be jealous of what we have Everything we have came from God. Pastor, what if he wants it all back? The Lord gave, and the Lord may take away. But the bottom line is, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this privilege. We have to worship you with our giving. You have been so good to us, so good to us. You have blessed us when we had need. You have healed our body, Lord Jesus. You've been a friend and a comforter in times of need. I pray, Lord, that you would bless this congregation as you have. Continue to bless them. Because, Lord, they are, they are loving givers. We give not because we have to give. We give because we love you. We pray, Lord, right now that you would bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name.
my soul, break through in my weakness, break through in my struggle. You are the kind, you are the God of the breakthrough in my worship, break through in my praise, break through when I live to glorify your name. Bibles to 1 Samuel. Of course, you're welcome to stand, but it is going to be a little bit of a lengthy reading, so you take that as you will, and uh, we'll pray your knees for those that stand. We'll make it all the way through the reading. I give honor to Pastor Shepherd and the ministry here. I love this church. I, g- I give honor to you and uh, to my wonderful wife, and most importantly, I give honor, honor to God. If you're at 1 Samuel 17, would you say amen? 1 Samuel 17 and verse 23. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same word. And David heard them, and all the men of Israel... When they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up 
surely to defy Israel is he come up and it shall be that the man who killeth him the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel apparently David was not listening very well because then he pops up and asked and spake to the men that stood by him in verse 26 saying what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine And taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. David's eldest brother, you may be seated. David's eldest brother, Eliab, was embarrassed and aggravated with David. Could you imagine on the battlefield, you're looking across at an army that is coming to invade your land. And here comes your roughly between 13 to 16 year old brother given his two cents about what should happen. Eliab was not too thrilled about it. He was embarrassed and aggravated with David. Why comest thou here? Who is guarding your flock? Questioning David to both mock and hopefully rid him of the pestilence that he so easily delivered. David has had enough now of Eliab. And responds in verse 29, is there not a cause? Here this oversized human is across the valley mocking our God. Is there not a cause that we fight for? Is there no value in why we are here? David is willing to fight Goliath despite the negativity of his sibling and the doubt of those around him. The Bible tells us that the words of David are rehearsed in the ear of Saul. And David is swiftly brought before the king. And and in verse 32, David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Speaking of the, the giant. Thy servant will go and will fight. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. Now I know this is a new revolutionary Bible story that you've never heard before about David and Goliath. And this is your first time. But I figure it appropriate for students Sunday. He said, but you are of your youth. He has been a warrior from his youth. You have not a chance. The king asks for David's credentials for fighting. David responds with his resume. I killed a lion. And a bear. By the time I was just a young boy. David did not come to play. He was not intimidated. He was not deterred. Realizing the call and the anointing on his life. Mixed with his previous victories. He knew the battle was won before it even began. He took his staff in his hand. And chose five smooth stones out of the brook. And put them in a shepherd's bag. Which he had. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth, ruddy and a fair countenance. And David, and the Goliath said to David, Am I a dog? That thou comest to me with staves. Then curse David by his gods. And Goliath said to David, Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. Skip to verse 48. And it came to pass when Goliath arose, came and drew nigh to David. That David hasted, ran towards the army to meet him. And David put his hand in his bag, took thence a stone and slung it. And smote Goliath in the forehead. That the stone sunk into his forehead and fell upon the face of the earth. So David prevailed with a sling 
and with a stone and Goliath and slew him but there was no sword in the hand of David therefore David ran and stood upon Goliath took his sword drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him cut off his head therewith and when the Philistines saw their champion was dead they fled today in the court of public opinion I would like to hopefully change your mind or alter your perspective on this story as we often look at David as the underdog, as the one smaller, as the one less than the giant, the one that had been fighting from his youth. Oftentimes we perceive the little guy versus the big one as David to be the one that did have no chance, didn't have the ability to fight. But today, if you'll let me, I would like to switch the narrative and say it was not David that was the underdog, but in, fight, in fact, Goliath is the underdog. Would you bow your heads one more time? Dear Lord, we come before you today, God. Would you one more time open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to receive? God, I thank you and I praise you for everything you've done. You've blessed us beyond measure. And today we try to grow and learn. Let me be a vessel for you, God, a conduit of your word. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. I, I am exhausted by the insecure church of the modern day. Young and old alike who feel like we are, for some reason, the underdogs and have remained spiritually captive to the enemy of this world. Like last place became our first choice. Like compromise is much better than sacrifice. This is, is not God's plan, nor was it his design when he died on the cross. We are overcomers through Christ. If not carefully guarded, our hearts will become the breeding ground of doubt. Our souls sucked into the world of compromise. As giants of this world come against us, our faith will not rise, but instead fall into the cave of spiritual depravity. We will recoil and recess into the safe places that we have tried to find in the world. I'm tired of prayer warriors that stand on the sidelines of spiritual warfare instead of getting into the fight for the souls around you. Young people of God provoked by giants that have no authority over them, yet they step aside to stave off ridicule. Often we have the appearance of a warrior, but we lack the willingness to fight. Why don't you go and fight? I tell you what, if we're going to have a battle, you go fight, and I'll be the photographer. I'll, I'll write the story about David, all right? I'll let David go out there and fight the giant. I'll write the story. It's a lot harder to be the one that gets into the fight. Some giving up so much to the giants of this world that they have been turned over to a reprobate mind. No, God did not declare that we are the tail, but rather the head. The back of the book says that we are the winners of the plan that God has for our life. Our king has never lost a battle one time in history, yet for some reason we feel as though we are unequipped to fight these spiritual battles. And we are believing the lie of the giants in this land. Have you succumbed to the lies of the enemy? And the giants of the land, have we believed the giants of our past sins that lurk in the secret vaults of our memory? Young man, has the giant called and caught on to your addiction that has gripped you in the midnight hour when it's just you and your cell phone and the door is closed? Has that giant called addiction found its way as the monkey on the back is it stuck to you like glue? Is that giant calling to you from across the valley? Coming for you each and every day. Is it stuck to you? Have you found yourself in the grasp of the giant? Young lady, has the mirror begun to speak lies into your innocent ears? 
And have you believed the giants of popular opinion and unrealistic body images that the world portrays? Your schools tell you that God is not real. Your job has persuaded you to care more about your financial account than your spiritual reserves. Have you listened to the giants for too long? There are giants in your land stealing and killing and destroying the harvest that God had planned for you. But you have now withdrawn yourself from the battle and you're watching as somebody else goes out and tries to fight the battle for you. There are giants in the land of our spiritual soul and you are scared. These giants scream at us so convincingly that we are the underdog, convincing us that we will never be more than a scared little boy and little girl. Life will not get better, only worse. God hasn't anointed you. The Holy Ghost was never real. We are the underdog. That's all we are. That's all you'll ever be. You won't amount to anything. The mirror of the lie that is telling you is always true that chirping little voice of the enemy in your brain is always right the giants have gotten in your head and now you're scared giants are in the land didn't you hear science has caught up with the Bible unless people believe in the Christian God or any God in general. Giants are yelling across the vastness of our souls and we are believing the lie and our spirits have waxed thin. Uh, I am tired of young people laying down the cross believing that captivity of the world is a lighter load to bear. Believing that surrender to the fleshly desires, though easy in the beginning, it is a terrible taskmaster in the long run. You find yourselves at the depths of their depravity and, and not only is there one giant, but there's multiple giants screaming in your ear, seemingly too large to conquer. And now you believe the lie. I am the underdog. I know it seems easier to surrender to the flesh, but sin is only pleasure for a short season. Don't surrender to the giants because God has not only anointed you, but he has equipped you with the word. He has equipped you with tools to fight in this battle. Don't listen to the giants. Fear not, David. Yes, you are anointed, but look in your hand. God has also equipped you. Why do we always forget that? David was not just, he was not just a small boy walking out there simply with the power of God, although he did have that. God equipped him with the tools to fight. God equipped you today with the tools to fight regardless of the lies of the enemy. God has done it. I don't know if you know this about life or not, but things are not always as they seem. Please don't think less of my intelligence as I go through this list. <clears throat> Did you know that if you flip a light switch halfway on, the light doesn't just turn halfway on? Food for thought. Who would have thunk that? A lead pencil doesn't contain lead, but instead it contains graphite. A peanut is not a nut. It's actually a legume. Side note, that word makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't know why. A shooting star is not a star at all. It's actually a meteor. Things are not always as they seem. A funny bone isn't funny at all. Please stop laughing when I'm in searing pain. <laughs> Things are not always as they seem. <clears throat> Another big shocker, bald eagles are not bald. Good job, America. <laughs> it's embarrassing. The whole rest of the world knows that's our animal, and then they find out it's not bald. Did nobody get close enough before they named it? 
Things are not always as they seem. Breaking news. Falling does not hurt. It's hitting the ground that really does the damage. Things are not always as they seem. A young boy enters a barber shop and the barber whispers to his customer, Out of all the light bulbs, this boy is clearly not the brightest. Watch and I'll prove it to you. <clears throat> the barber puts a dollar bill in one hand and he puts two quarters in the other. Then calls the boy over and asks, Which do you want, son? The boy swiftly takes the two quarters and leaves. What did I tell you, said the barber, that, that kid never learns. Later, when the customer leaves, he sees the same young boy coming out of the ice cream store. Hey, boy, may I ask you a question? Why did you take the quarters instead of the dollar bill? The boy licked his cone and replied, because the day I take the dollar bill, the game is over. <laughs> Things are not always as they seem. Roughly 3,000 years ago, David showed an army of Israelites and the rest of humanity that things are not always as they seem, even when facing a giant. In Israel, there's a geographical pass of soft sloping ridges and valleys between the coastal plains of the Judean mountain ranges it stretches about an estimated six to nine miles, depending on what place you're at. This place is called the Shufala. The Shufala is widely considered to be one of the most beautiful land masses in Israel, with forests of oak, wheat fields, and rolling hills. Sadly, due to it being somewhat of a geographical highway from the ocean into the mountains, which happens to be the perfect tactical high ground. It became a place often used for invasion. Enter the story of the Philistines. Largely a seafaring people, they found themselves on the coast of Israel. They navigated their way through the, the Shufala, making tracks for high ground that could divide Israel and give them the tactical advantage. Saul, getting word of their maneuvers, decided to bring his armies down to cut them off at the pass. As the enemies encountered, as the armies encounter each other, they find themselves divided by a valley called Elah. The Israelites anchor on the northern ridge, the Philistines on the southern. For one army to attack the other, they must first give up the high ground, which means at the worst, extremely high casualties, at the best, a loss in the battle. Neither option seems very appealing. They are in a stalemate. Neither army is moving. Neither is attacking. Day after day they look across the valley but no one moves to fight or to pull the first punch. They are in a stalemate. Finally, the Philistines decide to present their best and implore the Israelites to do the same. One warrior against one warrior. One man against one man. The Philistines' best Against Israel's best, the winner takes all. Every day, that big old giant Goliath would walk his way down into the valley to mock Israel. To ridicule the one true living God and to call out any man to come and fight him. The men of Israel had no desire to fight or to die to a giant, this mono -e mono battle would not only take their life, but whoever lost, they would then be slaves to the people that were victors. A lot was riding on this fight, death and potentially slavery. Who would want to fight a giant? Everyone was scared. Their backs were against the wall. It was gloom and doom. Everybody was pouting and down and Scared, shaking in their boots, if you will. But it was bad times and everyone knew. But don't worry, the church always prevails. David rolls up to the northern ridge with a wagon full of cheese and a brain full of curiosity. He is not there long before he hears the uncircumcised Philistine booming voice echoing across the valley. David, realizing that no one has accepted the challenge of the giant, is baffled to his core. Who would allow someone to defy God and live? 
This was unacceptable. Something had to be done. David volunteers and somehow Saul allows a boy estimated to between, be between 13 and 16 years old to fight a mighty giant of war. Please note, the minimum, wage, minimum age of that time was 20 years old to fight in a battle. 20 years old. And here is this young lad that is now willing to fight this battle. Nevertheless, of his size... Saul himself being scared accepts David's request to fight. Saul puts his armor and weaponry on David's scrawny shoulders since David had none of his own. He now from scripture, we know from scripture that Saul was head and shoulders above all the land of Israel. Yet David was just a boy. The armor was too big. David clinked and clanked and stumbled around in the armor and only to realize that he had not proved this armor. It was more of a hindrance than it was a help. David lays down the oversized armor in exchange for a shepherd's staff, sling, and five smooth stones. Since I'm sure, as previously mentioned, this is your first time hearing the story, don't worry. It turns out well. You see, the stones that David picked up were not just any stones. These that he picked up were formed by barium sulfate, which made them exceptionally dense and hardened. Something else to note, in that day, slings were an extremely important part of warfare. Men of the era were both powerful and accurate with a sling. Historians found that slingers were able to hit targets upwards of 100 yards away, maiming, oftentimes killing their target with a slingshot. He didn't walk out there with a toy. He was equipped. He didn't walk out into the battlefield with just the anointing of God. God has specifically given him a weapon. He had given him something to fight with. Young person, can I tell you today that God has not submitted you to the battlefield of life without weaponry, but he has put you specifically in a place where you can use the tools that he has given you to fight against the devourer of the enemy. I rebuke the devourer of the enemy over your life that tells you that you're not good enough, you're not valuable enough, you're not anointed enough, and that you don't have the equipment. God has equipped you. On top of that, further investigation records men sniping birds from the sky with their sling. That's how impressive the accuracy was. Contrary to the images conjured in our heads, things are not always as they seem. David was carrying no toy. It was a legitimate weapon that was extremely deadly. He was extremely accurate. When he walked onto that field of battle, he had every intention of hitting Goliath right between the eyes. Goliath sees David coming and begins to mock him. Oh, Goliath, I hate to tell you, but you're the underdog. Things are not as they seem. He begins to mock David as he's coming towards him. Much like the barber, Goliath saw before him a light bulb that was not so bright. With all the anointing on his life and with a God-equipped weapon, David declares to Goliath, Thou comest at me with a sword and with a spear. And with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. I wonder, reading over this story, I wonder how you feel it in the atmosphere when the Holy Ghost begins to move. I know this was Old Testament, but I know that the anointing was on David's life. And I wonder that when he said that, if... If all of a sudden the Philistines begin to feel their spine crawl a little bit. Because there's something powerful when a man is standing before what seems to be apparent death. But has courage, passion, and authority. In the eyes of man, David had no shot. He was the underdog. But I wonder when he uttered those words... The Philistines realized what they were up against. 
as the faith in David began to swell, his adrenaline no doubt kicked in. He was ready to fight. But here's a key point. He was not about to fight the style that Goliath wanted to. The church today, unfortunately, has found itself in a predicament where instead of fighting the fight God has called us to fight, we would rather compromise the message to fight the battle that the enemy wants us to fight. We have relinquished our conviction to hopefully have more people come and hear a false message. We have laid down the callings on our life of true separation and holiness to God. Hoping that we can convert more people to a fake message. We have failed to fight the fight that God has called us to. Instead, we compromise and we try to put on the armor of Saul and go out there with our oversized sword into battle with weaponry we have not tried. And fight the battle of the enemy. David did not walk onto that battlefield. To fight the fight Goliath came to. There was no sword in his hand. There was nothing but a sling. Because God had put him specifically there. With the tools that he had given him. To fight that battle. For that day. For that time. God used it. I wonder if they felt. The proverbial wind shifting. And begin to yell from the front lines, Goliath, things are not as they seem. Something is different in the air. I don't know if the air shifted or if the anointing began to fill the land. But Goliath, something is different. With six rotations per second, David releases that hardened and dense rock at the velocity of 100 plus miles per hour, striking Goliath in the head. He removes the sword from the sheath and decapitates Goliath. Goliath, things are not as they seem. Please hear me. Yes, David was anointed. God, there is no, by God, there is no doubt. David had a calling on his life. There is no doubt. David was willing to fight. There is no doubt. But when God placed him on the battlefield, David was not only anointed, but he was equipped for the battle. God placed him in the perfect place with the perfect sling and the perfect rock and the perfect person to do it the musicians would come I've come to tell you today that God will never leave you nor will he forsake you furthermore not only has God anointed you and called you to his kingdom but he has equipped you for the battle yes this fight is not yours it's the Lord for the outcome. But do you remember the story where the men helped lift the hands of Moses? There were still men down there fighting, even though God was involved. Because not only was God with them, but it still required the people of God to fight. It's one thing if you have the tools. It's another thing if you refuse to use them. We have too many young people and adults that are wondering why the enemy is having such an attack on their life. Maybe it's because you have the tools, but you forgot to use them. Showing up to the fight is half the battle. You still got to fight the battle. You still got to fight the battle. He's given you weapons to use against the enemy of your soul. And we will always be by your side. Because late in the midnight hour, God will turn it around. When money is gone, God will turn it around. When the enemy comes in like a flood, he'll lift up a standard. Because not only are we anointed, he has equipped me for the battle. God will not just anoint you, but he'll be there by your side 
to tell you what to do. He'll give you the equipment to fight with, young and old alike. In your spiritual land, there are giants that are reaching for your soul. Young people, hear me. There are giants coming for your soul today in every school hallway. Just a few clicks away in your cell phone, there are giants screaming for your soul. Just a few drinks more, there are giants screaming for your soul. Just to smoke one more, there are giants screaming for your soul. Just for one more unmarital sexual encounter, there are giants screaming for your soul. Just one more, just to one more. There are giants in the land. They are intimidating and they never let you forget their unrelenting presence. You have tried to ignore them, but to no avail because there are giants in the land. Every day they make their way into the valley of your soul, calling out to your failures. Calling out to your addictions. Calling out to your insecurities. There are giants in the land. But all is not lost. God has not only anointed you, but He has equipped you. When I hear the giants calling, I, I pick up my two-edged sword. <laughs> that God has equipped me with and I step onto the battlefield because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. When I see the enemy, I am reminded I am equipped with stones. These things have I spoken unto you. I throw a stone with another scripture that you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I remember the stones I have. Paul and Silas were in prison, but they begin to sing. Moses was anointed, but God gave him an errand, and he gave him a word. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were standing on the edge of the furnace and they said, even if you kill us, I'll still serve them. And when they look into the fire, it was not as it would seem because when there was three, there was four. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When the children of Israel marched around the walls, it was not as it seemed. When they closed the door to that tomb. But three days later, out of that tomb came the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It was not as they supposed. God has not only anointed you, He has equipped you. When giants are in the land and all hope is lost, it is not as it seems. We have spiritual weapons. If we would just hide them in our hearts, we could always produce a victory because com combination with the anointing and being equipped, we are always victorious. David, you are not the underdog. Young person, Elder, and all who hear me today, you are anointed and equipped to fight not only for your soul, but every soul around you. <coughs> we stand on a battlefield of giants that are fighting for our souls. Do you still have fight in you or have you already surrendered? Young person, do you still, 
Remember, I don't care how young you are. You still remember the call, the still small voice of Jesus tugging at your heart. Do you find yourselves in the back row of the army looking over the edge as, as David fights? Or do you find yourself being willing to get into the battle yourself?